we'll get started with neonatal pneumonia. Um, for uh, newborns, it's possible that they can be born already infected with something. And the way they could have an infection upon birth is that um, like a virus crossed over from the mom's blood um, into the placenta and infected the fetus that way. Uh, another way that they can become infected in their lungs is um, once the amniotic sac that, that they exist in breaks or ruptures and they lose that protective fluid, um, bacteria can migrate um, from the vagina up into the uterus and infect the fetus. Um, that's why if membranes rupture, um, and they can't stay ruptured for too long before labor begins for that very reason. It's because um, once membranes rupture, bacteria can get in and infect the fetus. Um, and then going through the birth canal, um, the birth canal is not sterile and they can acquire pneumonia that way. Then once they're born and they're in their environment, then they can acquire a nosocomial pneumonia from poor hand washing or something that infects the mouth. Um, so that's everything in a nutshell. Let's go through the slides. Um, it gives you a list of organisms that can cause neonatal pneumonia. Um, the group B streptococcus, again, is colonized in the vaginal tract, and that's how it can be acquired during delivery. Um, e. coli can also be um, contaminate the, either the fetus when the amniotic fluid breaks or during birth. Um, staph pneumonia can be acquired after. And then this just lists the different ways of the infection getting into the baby. So prior to birth, it can be crossing over the placenta. Um, Haemophilus influenza, nope. <laughs> um, HIV AIDS can be acquired via the placenta. Depending on what mom's um, load is with the virus in her blood. So if mom is on antiretrovirals for AIDS, and the viral count is really low, then it won't affect the fetus, as long as mom is on the um, antivirals. So if the amniotic fluid becomes infected, and of course the amniotic fluid goes in and out of the lungs, that's another way. And then to acquire it after birth would be somebody's hands um, infect the newborn. So the infection will present um, at birth and within a week if it came during labor and delivery or it was acquired in utero. Um, but after seven days, that's not going to be caused by something that happened in utero or during delivery. That's going to be acquired by their environment. Um, so treatments would be antibiotics or antivirals. Ventilation, again, if there's respiratory distress and they can no longer maintain normal CO2s. A four-day-old infant born at 27 weeks gestation develops recurrent symptoms of RDS. The infant had been removed from mechanical ventilation and extubated on day three and was receiving nasal CPAP with an FiO2 of 0.4 when lung function acutely worsened. Chest radiographs show a widespread diffuse granular pattern and analysis of arterial blood sample from umbilical line demonstrates that oxygen saturation is refractory to increases in FiO2. The most likely cause for these recurrent symptoms of RDS is um, either progressive periods of apnea, PDA, meconium aspiration, or postnatal pneumonia? And the answer is D, postnatal pneumonia. It would be nice if they'd mention, like, um, you know, labs were drawn and they show elevated white blood count, or you see increased fever. None of that is mentioned, so. It's, yeah, it's so just that D the, is the best. So what's the determining factor of PTPCL? Would be the typical sign. So yes, your infiltrates on x-ray, but also a leukocytosis, 
um, fever. Yeah, and here it's not painting that things. picture. It's yeah. just saying um, their lungs, their um, x-ray is getting worse. Yeah. So That's with this one, it's only D because we know it's not the other three. Um, so this says, an infection will require radiographic findings to change from normal to severely abnormal over a few days. Um, you can get pleural effusions, pulmonary edema, pneumatoceles, cardiomegaly, barotrauma. ABGs will show hypoxemia refractory to oxygen therapy, hypercapnia, just obvious distress, I guess. A newborn infant begins to develop signs of respiratory distress at five days of life. A cerebrospinal fluid culture tests positive for beta streptococcus infection. Which mode of transmission is most likely the cause of the infection? Um, Transplacental, like it came across the placenta, or perinatal, the time of delivery? Placenta only? Oh boy. <laughs> Perinatal or postnatal or postnatal only? C. So C, perinatal, so during delivery or at the time of delivery. Um, group B strep has emerged as a predominant pathogen in neonatal pneumonia. It is a serious threat to the newborn, is acquired during labor. All right, next we have congenital diaphragmatic hernia. And we need a picture to show what that is. So during uh, fetal development, the diaphragm begins as two separate leaves, they call them, and they grow together to form the diaphragm. And sometimes they don't come together completely and they're left open. And when the diaphragm doesn't close completely, now there's nothing to separate the thorax from the abdominal organs. Um, so the abdominal organs, as they're growing, they just go wherever there's room, and that's up into the thorax. Okay, I have no idea why they're doing tracheal ligation. Um, could you guys just ignore this? Um, pay attention to the first picture that shows abdominal contents in the thoracic cage. So, all these loops of air, it's just air in the intestines. And here we've got the stomach showing. It says the infant will need breathing support because when the intestines are in the thorax, they're squeezing the lungs, and the lungs don't develop normally. Um, so you don't get the um, conducting airways developing, you don't get the alveolar sacs, the alveoli. So you just basically get pulmonary hypoplasia. So that lung does not develop normally. Um, so once the surgery is done and the intestines are pulled back into the abdomen, it's not like night and day where suddenly the infant is better and now they can breathe well on their own. Um, so they typically require some sort of ventilation, whether it's conventional ventilation or high frequency ventilation. The other issue with this is once they're born and they're showing distress, if you start bagging with positive pressure, um, we all know that when we bag with positive pressure to get the air into the lungs, some air goes down the esophagus and gets in the stomach. Um, we can help that by extending the head, but we can't stop it completely. So as you're bagging an infant that has congenital diaphragmatic hernia, air does fill up the intestines. So the more air in the intestines, the more pressure it's going to exert in the thorax. And then it's going to start squeezing the heart. The heart won't be able to pump, and um, 
and they'll have a cardiac arrest shortly after. So if you can catch this before they're born, uh, don't bag until an NG tube is put in, it's connected to suction, and then you can start assisting them with their breathing. All right, so how does this happen? This is the, the factors responsible for the development of congenital diaphragmatic hernia are unknown, um, but the pleural peritoneal canal fails to close about six to seven weeks of gestation. And then that results in the intestines entering the thorax. Compression of the lungs and heart lead to pulmonary hypoplasia, pulmonary hypertension, pulmonary immaturity, and also deficiencies in the surfactant and um, antioxidant enzyme system. Antioxidant enzyme system is just a way of the immune system keeping free radicals in check. So you would think that, all right, if they've got this congenital diaphragmatic hernia, let's get them to surgery as soon as they're born and get those intestines out of the thorax. And that's not what happens because um, the newborn has to be stabilized first. So you have to make sure you're able to ventilate them. Um, so before they can go to surgery, they need to be stabilized. Um, they may need to go on ECMO where blood is taken out of their body, oxygenated, and put back into their body. Um, the pulmonary hypertension that comes along with this disease responds to nitric oxide, which is our, our lecture coming up. And then HFOV is high-frequency oscillatory ventilation, and that's another um, way of ventilating these new This is just showing blood being taken out of the um, superior vena cava, oxygenated, and then put back in to the right atrium. All right, so what is the survival like for these babies that are born with the intestines in their thorax. I don't see any percentages here. We get long-term restrictive and obstructive defects. Um, they have failure to thrive. Um, some of them have, there's esophageal abnormalities because everything didn't develop correctly. Um, they can have scoliosis. Um, they're thoracic cavity doesn't develop correctly, and 50% of them will have learning and developmental disabilities. Um, which are true concerning a congenital diaphragmatic hernia? Um, it gives you five choices. Does it give you combinations? No. All right, so one, pulmonary hyperplasia is present in both lungs. Is that true or false? Okay. Um, persistent pulmonary hypertension is the main complication. Yeah, pulmonary hypertension is a big problem because if those pulmonary vessels constrict and they don't relax, it's really hard to oxygenate those babies. Um, so, and that's typically what happens. So, it is a complication. Three. Surgical correction results in complete reversal of respiratory distress. False. That's false because of the hypoplasia or the lungs didn't develop. Um, congenital diaphragmatic hernia formation is a defect that occurs very early in the gestational age. That's true. I think it said six to seven weeks of gestation. And the right lung or the contralateral side is not usually affected. And that's something I didn't tell you, but that is true. Usually on the right side, you've got the liver protecting the abdominal organs from going up into the thorax. But if the anomaly happens on the left side, there's nothing to stop the organs from migrating up into the thorax. All 
right, so a 3,200 gram term infant male is born to a healthy mother. Apgar scores are seven and five. The infant is gasping. Heart rate is decreasing to 90. Physical examination reveals cyanosis. A scaphoid abdomen. Do you know what that means? Scaphoid? Is it protruding? Opposite. Oh, so Sucked in. Inverted. Yeah, so instead of the abdomen being normal, it's like caved in or, or concave. Um, there's visible tracheal deviation to the right. What would cause the trachea to not be midline but to be pushed over to the right side? A pneumonia. Okay, so a lot of air on the left will push everything over to the right. Um, so considering this inf information, the only appropriate action would be to A, get a blood gas, B, bag mask ventilate, C, suction and stimulate vigorously. D, insert an oral suction catheter to vent the stomach. Or E, vigorously stimulate and give 100% O2 by blow by. All right, so if we bag, bag valve mask ventilate, we're going to put air into the intestines that are up in the thorax. And that would cause the blood pressure to decrease and worsen everything. Um, C, suction and stim stimulate vigorously. Um, what would you suction? The trachea? Yeah, so the, the problem isn't secretions in the trachea. Now if that was baby poop or the meconium that we talked about, then yes. But here we've got a scaphoid abdomen telling us that the intestines are up in the thorax. And we know that if those intestines fill with air, it's going to compromise the heart from contracting, the blood pressure is going to drop. So they're gasping, heart rate's decreasing, they need to be ventilated. So you would think that we should start bag mass ventilating, but we're going to be putting air into the intestines. So what should we do so first? So E? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. You want to uh, E. How about oral catheter into the invent the stomach? Oh. Yeah, so letter D. Get the air out of the stomach. Once that tube is in place, now we can start bagging. So, so this is bent the stomach. I thought that was like yeah, I thought that's what I thought. Ah. Oh, I see. Oh, I see. That's why you guys stayed away from that. <laughs> okay. All right. What would you use for ventilator strategies? Um, do you want to maintain hypoxic gases? Remember, low O2 is going to cause pulmonary vessels to constrict. So no for A. What about rapid rate and low pressure? Maybe. High pressure, long inflation times? No. A slow rate, short inflation times? Yeah, if we have a slow rate and we allow CO2 to climb, that's going to constrict the pulmonary vessels. We want to keep the pulmonary vessels dilated. Um, low pressure with high PEEP. Do you want to have high pressure inside the lungs? No. So the letter B.
Yeah.